Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 218, recorded Monday, September 28th, 2015. Phil Baker, the product guy. Triangulation is brought to you by PillPack, a full service pharmacy that combines personalized service, convenient packaging, and modern technology to make your life easier. Visit pillpack.com slash twit to save $20 on vitamins and OTCs when you transfer your prescriptions. And by 99designs. 99designs is the entrepreneur's number one choice for high quality, affordable design. To get the perfect design for your logo, business card, website, app, or more, visit 99designs.com slash twit and receive a $99 service upgrade for free. And by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we get to interview some of the most interesting people in technology. You get to interview them too. If you're watching live, you can pass along your questions through our chat room at irc.twit.tv. I, uh, I, I like having old friends on Triangulation, and I've known Phil Baker for an age. Phil is what we call a product guy. Uh, I first met, now I've, have, welcome Phil. Thank you. It's, it's nice to see you. Great to be here, Leo. You are currently working at Pono Music. We're going to talk a little bit about that. You also have a book, which I didn't realize came out a while ago. I remember seeing it which I really like and I think is very timely, from concept to consumer, that's about how to cr take your idea and make it a product. Correct. And you've done that for a lot of companies. I've done it for a long time, yeah. So I'm thinking you were working for uh, Seiko. You're right. Is it right? That's right. Epson Seiko. That's right. And they were, it was label, label printer. Exactly. I remember. Wow, what a memory. <laughs> and that Phil was, was going to tell me before the show began. I said, wait, let me see if I remember on the air. And that was it. KGO. Was it a KGO yes. when I was doing the radio show there? Right. You were just getting into computers. No, I'd been in computers oh. <laughs> for a while. I got into computers, uh, uh, first started writing uh, about computers in 78 or 79 for Byte and Info World. Oh, really? So I'd been doing it for a while, but we had just started doing com computer radio talk. to work, and I started that right. in 92. Right. Did he introduce you to me? Probably. I don't know. Yeah. I, um... I and then I was at KGO doing the Saturday Night Show right. in the uh, early 90s. Hey, 23 look. years ago, wow. Phil. It's <laughs> a long time. How does it, we look so young and vital. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what, so what do you consider your job to be when you work for these companies? You've worked for so many great companies. Well, my, my experience and what I love doing is taking an idea and bringing it to market. Right. And, it's not. It's You're just not a not, traditional PR guy. No, 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 I'm not PR. I'm an engineer. I'm a physicist by background and have a business degree, but primarily my my experience has been to figure out how to get a product from an idea to the market. Yeah. And you know, it's one thing about ideas. Ideas are. I'm not. I take other people's ideas. I have my own you, ideas. Are you an inventor? Do you do that? I've, some, I've done bit? invent. I've done a lot of products, but I enjoy being creative in terms of getting the product to market, as well as just coming up with the idea. Because what I've learned through the ages is the idea is the easy part. Right. Anyone can come up with an idea, and a lot of people do. But it's how do you take that idea and make it successful? And there are so many things along the way that can get in the way or make a difference. And so my my role has been to work with companies that have an idea and f help them find a way to bring it to market without spending a fortune. Yeah. You know, what, what, what's the best way? And so I, I bet you everybody in the chat room, everybody watching the show right now, has an idea. We they all have, have ideas, yeah. right? <laughs> something that would change That's the right. world. That's right. And, and the, the hard part is just figuring out how to do it. Well, and I think there are people that are going to take advantage of you, too. 
What do you think? I see the ads all the time. You know, George Foreman. You got an idea? I can help you get it patented. I can help you get it. You know, most of those are fraudulent. I mean, most of those, they want your money. They'll give you some kind of a booklet they put together, but they don't deliver the product to the market. It's hard work, and you can't can't do it for thousands Subcontract of people. It to somebody yeah. else. Yeah. You have to do it yourself, and yeah. you have to do it with a few smart people. Dick D. Bartolo talks about this all the time. Of course, you know, sure. you know Dick. And uh, he and I both kind of hate to do this, but we are often the bearer of bad tidings. People will say, I got a great idea. And Dick will say, you know how much it's going to cost you to make a prototype, to get it to market, before you'll even know if it's a good idea? Exactly right. It's a, it's a lot of money. And one thing, you know, I've had a lot of inventors come to me and say, I had this great idea and I took all my savings and I patented it. I applied for a patent. Right. And I'll tell them sometimes a patent doesn't mean anything because these days patents take years to come right. to get. And as a result, you may get a patent, but it, all that is is a license to sue. <laughs> and it doesn't stop anybody from it copying. Turns people into patent trolls is what it does. Exactly. They end up never making a product. And you never make. A Do you product. remember the first product you brought to market? I worked for Polaroid, and uh, my first product was this plastic camera, color pack camera that actually. Yeah, I remember that. Remember the peel apart film? Yeah. And, yeah. So I worked for you Polaroid. Looks out of like you got a Polaroid uh, with you. Where'd you put that? You I, you have an SX-70, I thought it was, is it? I do, this is one of the Holy, original. Here, you got a camera right there if you want to show it or I can show it too. See where that camera is? It's on your knee. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this isn't this is real TV. Here, give it to me because I'll have to show it. This isn't real TV, this is, this is uh, we have, we, we don't have camera operators, we have them suspended from the oh, ceiling, so you just have to put it where the camera is. Nobody, yeah. nobody can aim it. Look at that, first of all, uh, I w- I, you unfold it. How do I fold it back? Just push the little arm on the on the other side. On the other side here. Push that. Because it's back. very um, compact. You know, these were really expensive. Because and I remember my dad bought one. Yeah. Is this real leather or simulated? It's real leather made by a company called Buxton. Buxton. You I remember, remember that. that I had a Buxton wallet, wallet. Company yeah. In uh, Rhode Island. Yeah, I was in Providence right. with Buxton. Yeah. Exactly. So you wouldn't know. This is a camera. And then I open it like, how do I open it? Is there Just a button? Just pull the back of the top. The back of the top? Yeah, right. Is right here? Pull that up, yep. I don't want to break it, because this is, how old is this? You know, that um, is Look at that. 45, 50 years. It's actually a beautiful thing, isn't it? It really is. It's a work of art. It was an incredible design at the time. And, the, and the, this was their best camera, right? This was their best camera. Yeah. Yeah. And the technology is really impressive. It has so many new things in there, you know, the the rubber bellows on the side, the, the seven or eight lenses inside to let you look through the lens. It's quite amazing. Oh, this is an SLR? Yes. So you can actually see through right. the lens. And then what are these dials here? So one is for focusing and one is for uh, exposure oh, yeah, you adjusting. You see the lens move, can't you? Right. Wow, and then this is brightness. Exactly. Amazing. And did it have la- it had some sort of interesting focusing mechanism? Was it a laser? What was it? It was no, a beam. They, well, on this ultrasonic. one, ultrasonic. Eventually, they came out with another model that was ultrasonic. Ultrasonic. And this one has a split image rangefinder, which is what well, I what I, what I developed. For, that's how Leica for them. works. I mean, they still you buy a Leica manual camera, you'll that's still a get range it. Rangefinder, right? Split image range. Is it? How does that work? It's a prism. And you're trying to get the the halves exactly. to line up, and it's about four times more accurate than just looking at a diffuse screen. That's why Leica does it, right? Right, exactly. It's very accurate. So it's actually there's a Fresnel lens mirror inside, and it's basically uh, you line oh, yeah. up a vertical. Oh line yeah. And just turn the wheel in the front. I think Dad had the ultrasonic. Yeah, and that came next. Yeah. When I worked on this one with Edwin Land. He never liked that. We had to put it in because we needed the focus. But he said, I don't like it, and I'm going to find a solution and wow. get rid of it. And what that led to was developing the ultrasonic autofocus. You worked with Edwin Land? I did, on that particular invention. So he was still around at Polaroid when they made this? He was around, yeah. Early, early 70s? He was in the 70s. This was late 70s. Late yeah, 70s. Yeah. Yeah. Edwin he, Land, he the Land until, camera. Until the early 80s. 
Wow. That is maybe one of the, even to this day, sweetest pieces of technology. It really is amazing, you know. Just incredible. We're talking to Phil Beck, uh, Phil Baxter. It's Phil Spector. Phil Baker. He, <laughs> is, he invented the wall of sound. No, he's, he's Phil, in jail. <laughs> he's, yes, not a good beast person to emulate. We're talking to Phil Baker, who's the product guy, helps brings products. How did you get this idea to, that this is what you studied physics? Studied physics, went to work for Polaroid. No, oh, this was your first job. First job, yeah. What I always a job. loved, I always loved gadgets. Yeah, you know, and it hasn't yeah. changed. No, you. I've like always a, thought of you as a gadget guy. Right. Yeah. Right. I had the HP 35 calculator. Do you remember that? Uh huh. Yeah. Very expensive when yeah. it first came out. I remember. I convinced my father to buy it for me. That's yeah. the calculator Steve Jobs sold. Oh no, I guess Waz sold his HP 35, and Jobs sold his Volkswagen. Was that uh, right? Volkswagen um, van his va to, to to start wow. Apple. Wow, is that yeah. right? I didn't know that. Yeah, and Waz of course worked at HP. Built the first right. Apple one with parts from HP. Wow. Offered it to them. They said, nah, there's no market. <laughs> no market for this. That's a hobbyist thing. Was, you... Carly, was Carly there at the time? Uh, no. <laughs> no. That was before Carly. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know. <laughs> Although she probably would have said the same thing. Exactly. Wow. Is this your personal? Uh... Yeah. Do you... Now, can you get film for it? Not easily. No. They're not making no, it anymore. It would have to be re somebody in somebody's refrigerator somewhere. You know, I think they're making peel apart film in, um, oh, okay. in Europe. Okay. There's and Polaroid. Star. While you may see the name, that's not the Polaroid no, no. you were. Polaroid for. is gone. It's gone. As we gone. knew it. There is a resurgence. There's a small little company that bought the name that's developing cameras. Right. Um, Lady Gaga did a. Right. Remember that? The Polaroid glasses? <laughs> and I, I thought. Do. That's not Edwin Land's Polaroid. I don't think so. Hey, we're going to take a break. I want to ask you a little about Quirky because the times have changed, or have they? It is easier to get a product to market. Certainly, That's right. the path is now well trodden, but, uh, but I, I think there's still pitfalls. Phil Baker is our guest, the product guy. Thank you. He's going to talk, he's going to talk about that in just a bit. I, you want to see a cool product? Yes. So a great product, Phil, I think you'd agree with this, solves a problem that a lot of people have in a, in a unique way that you can immediately grasp its value. And then, so when you see it, you go, I need that. So here's the problem. A lot of us take vitamins, medications, hard to remember as you get older, harder and harder. Did I take it today? I can't remember. Uh, a lot of uh, people have uh, family members, parents who are on meds, but you, how do you get them to take it? It's, it's kind of a challenge. So there's a new pharmacy out there. It's called Pill Pack. You ever hear of these guys? It's a full service pharmacy. They will actually make it easy for you to transfer your prescriptions over to PillPack. But the invention that makes it so cool is this. When you send them your prescriptions, they'll fill them in this pill pack. And you, it's, you pull out the today's, see what it says? 12 p.m. Saturday. This, uh, by the way, I don't know who Elliot Williams is, and I'm sorry I stole <laughs> your pills. But Elliot's only on vitamins, so I think we're okay. Good. So you tear it off. There's never a question, did I take it? Because if it's here, you didn't take it, right? It's easy to open it up. And now you know you're getting the exact right medication and exact right dosage at the exact right time. They use very sophisticated scanning technology to make sure that each pill pack has the exact right medication. That's something that even a pharmacist can't always guarantee. Although they have the computers, they have the scanners, and they also have the pharmacist. So you're getting like double checked to make sure you're getting exactly the right medications. They deliver them directly to you for free. And you can call their pharmacist 24-7 from the privacy of your home. So if you have a question about your medication, it's easy to get some information, some answers. Shipping is always free. There's literally no extra cost above your copay for medications. And they do take most major insurance plans, including most forms of Medicare Part D. Pill pack. You just call them. They will call your doctor. They'll make sure that, the, you know, they'll... They'll manage your refills so you never run out. You don't even have to think about it because they know exactly how much you've got. They'll send you the next pill pack without your, you just, it comes. It takes about five minutes to sign up on their site. It's easy. One of the top 25 inventions of last year, according to Time Magazine. Our friend Jill Duffy gave it a great review in PC Magazine. There's even an app for your iPhone and your watch. It says, take your meds. They're in the pill pack. Pull out the next pill pack. This is brilliant. If you've got uh, family members who are on meds, if you take even, by the way, over-the-counter medication they'll do, and even supplements and vitamins, uh, PillPack. Go to PillPack.com slash twit. Sign up now. 
If you use that link and transfer your prescriptions to PillPack, we'll give you a credit toward $20 worth of vitamins and over-the-counter medications. PillPack.com slash T-W-I-T, P-I-L-L-P-A-C-K. What a brilliant idea. PillPack. Elliot, I've got your vitamins here. <laughs> <coughs> it says what it's in it. This is a, so he's got a cranberry uh, supplement, vitamin C and vitamin D. And there, and there. Isn't that clever? It's a great idea. See, that's a brilliant, see, isn't it? That's right. Like, that's what you're looking for, an idea that solves a, a common problem in an ingenious new way. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Okay, so, I'm talking to Phil Baker. Let me show you his new book, his old it's book. Kindle, it's Bonds everywhere. Noble, everywhere. Look. This is called From Concept to Consumer, and it is kind of, is, would you say a manual for getting your idea to the market? It's a fun book to read. It's the story. There's a, lot of, it's, yeah. there's a story, there's a lot of examples, yeah. but it's also very informative. Did you work on that, the stowaway keyboard? I certainly did, yeah. Andy Inako loves that. But this is an example of why this is, there's, there's peril in this. The people invented this, it was brilliant, I'm sure they patented it. We did. And now it's made in China by 800 other companies. That's right. And, and you can't tell the difference one from the other. It's a fold-up keyboard. That's right. Did that put them out of business, or? No, we um, developed the product. We sold it through Palm and through Tavis. Yeah, I remember that, And yeah. we followed the trajectory of the Palm Pilot. Right. When Palm went up, we went up. We sold about two million units. Okay. And then when Palm sales tanked, <laughs> they, you know, the keyboards slowed down. Right. The, we tried developing it for phones. There wasn't a lot of interest. Now there is, of course. Now there is. Especially yeah. with tablets. That's where the market is right exactly. now. Exactly. But yeah. I think with tablets, you want, you can do a full-size keyboard without carrying around anything that's bigger than the tablet. Right. That's, that's the beauty of... The, 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 the stowaway was the size of the palm. So you exactly. didn't have to have that's an extra right. big thing. Right. Andy Anako loves them. He uses those fold-up keyboards like crazy. Great. And we, had, uh, uh, we have a fellow who comes to visit us every year. Uh, who, uh, he's an expert on ARM processors, so he goes to China several times a year, and he always brings us stuff like <laughs> iPhone clones right. that are indistinguishable, right? Because they're probably made in the same factory, a lot of these things, right? Well, they're usually made by other kinds of companies right. than the ones that made the original. Right. Uh -huh. But the stowaway, there are, uh, I'm not kidding, he brought us 15 different folding keyboards. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. You know? Is this uh, is one of these? Uh... And that was a sequel to the Stowaway, which. Um... Don't tell me. I'm sure I'll figure this out. <laughs> it's a Chinese puzzle, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, there's a button. Here. You know, of course, the first time you don't, it's hard to figure out, and then once you figure it out, you know how to open this. Uh, is it this button here? What is what is? <laughs> there. Oh, whoa! Something <laughs> happened. Something happened. I'm, I, am I making? Am I making progress? You're getting close. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's so cute. So that one is rigid. The problem with the original one was it was kind of wimpy. It was flexible. Right. right. Uh, this is, uh, now, is this still on the market or is this also? No, that's pretty much gone. Pretty much gone, gone. huh? And Think outside. What fun, though. So how does this work? So. The company comes to you and say, with a drawing, with an idea? How far down the road? Well, in that case, I was a co-founder of that company. Oh, you were there. Yeah, I was you there. You were the guy. So, yeah. um, and I worked for companies like, I worked for Apple. I did the second Newton. I managed the hardware for that. How fun that must have been. That was great. But see, here was what's happened. And thank you, Apple. Because now they're making iPhones, 45 million iPhones every few months. They have streamlined this process, and China has, correct me if I'm wrong, but I get the sense China has geared up with precision machining and factories. They, they have the know-how to, to do this, and we all benefit a little bit because it's not just, now that Apple's kind of taught them how, everybody can go to China and say, I have an idea, can you make this? You, you might have to work with them to get it working. Right, right. I've done uh, dozens of projects. <laughs> Wait a minute. Burke, do you have the same, you have one. Is it a think outside? Yes. Yep, it is. I don't know if this is the different. Is this yours, Burke? No, that's similar to that one. Alex Lindsay gives me. Alex Lindsay has it. But I was running up here to see if the They wow. live, Phil Baker, they, they still live, live yeah, on. I know. They never die. They never die. So when you first did the Newton, 
none of that infrastructure existed, right? No, I went to uh, Taiwan at the time, and I found a little company called Inventec, which was about a $200 million company, and their business had been making Apple clones. Oh, <laughs> Apple and they were out clones. of business? Well, no, they were not out of business no, at that time. They were still they, making them. And they started making notebooks for companies, right. and I used them to build uh, the second generation of the Newton. And, uh, but they had to build factory, they had to build machinery to make the Newton. You're almost inventing the uh, process. process of production as much as you are inventing the product. You really are. But now it's a different story. Um, now you can have a 3D design in your computer, you bring them a USB key, they make right. a prototype, which won't work, right. <laughs> and things will be in the wrong place. So there is some iteration that goes back. There's a lot of iteration, yeah. and I've done a lot of projects in China, and uh, you know now China is the place to go. When I worked right. for Polaroid, I started going to Japan of all places. That was the place. Oh to no, go. I'm not surprised. And that was, and it was never for the money. It was never to find places cheaper to make it. It was to make to be able to get to the to the market much sooner. Um, well, that's interesting. Yeah. It's not price; it's speed. It's speed and it's the infrastructure, particularly China today. Um, it's, you know, if 90% of the cost of a product is the electronics, the cost of building that anywhere in the world is pretty much the same. But the issue is you have the infrastructure. All the parts are local. You can get quick turnaround. You can, if you have a design problem, while you're building, you call up the factory, they're down the street, they come by, you solve a problem in a day or two. Right. If you're trying to assemble all the product, the products in the U.S., um, you have to put the parts on the ocean or you have to fly them over. Because the parts are coming from Asia. Because the parts are coming from Asia. So we just don't have, unfortunately, we just don't have the infrastructure in right. the U.S. to be able to compete. So when a Motorola tries to do the Moto Maker in Texas, or Apple tries to make its Mac Pros in Texas, right. they're almost swimming upstream. It's almost going back to the old, bad old days of doing this stuff. Well, exactly. And, you know, the d displays, for example, come from Asia. So you put, you have to, these companies have to spend a lot of money putting it into the pots that then have to be shipped. And since you don't want to fly them over, you're going to have a lot of pots on the ocean. And that's slow. Up a lot of money. Literally a slow right. boat from China. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and let's say you get the pots into your factory in Texas. The Motorola was really doing final assembly there. You get the display and you find out there's something wrong. Oh, no. What do you do? You may have right. mil you know, hundreds of thousands on the ocean. If you're doing it in the in China, in the same town or nearby right. for where the factory is, you can correct things instantly, and you can get engineers from the factory in to fix things. Right. That's why building products in China is is what is done these days There's, because all of the factories are there that make the pots. Right. There's an economy of scale, it's, so it's not necessarily the cheap labor, although no, it is cheap labor, right? right? You know, it's. Uh, cheap in our standards, but it's still, you know, the people on the assembly line in high-tech factories are making several dollars an hour, you know, mm -hmm. two or three dollars an hour. Which if, for those countries is, is, good. is good money. Right, yeah. right. It's not, you know, remember the New York Times did this expose yeah. about, it's, it's not like a lot of what you read. It's really a great place to work, um, to get things done. You have capable people, the factories are clean. Particularly in high tech, I've never come across some of these factories that, you know, are described in the press that right. are, you know, backwards where they employ underage people. That doesn't happen to a, any great degree in the high tech world. Not at the Foxcons. No. The issue, though, I think does trickle down a little bit to hiring practices because there's a lot of staff and they have to staff up quickly and sometimes right. they have to staff down quickly. And suppliers, because if you're getting the little vibrator, that vibe That's that buzzes right. a thing that may be made in the Philippines or somewhere else where standards are lower and companies like Apple aren't really paying attention. They have to start moving farther down, don't they? Farther well, down the right. chain. Well, that's right. And so I think a few years ago, Mattel was selling a toy that had some lead paint or something mm -hmm. like that. And mm -hmm. you know, I, and I wrote about it in my book. I think the, the, the issue there is Motorola has an obligation right. to look 
and find out where all their components come from. Right. And when they rely on a subcontractor who then subcontracts, you don't know what can happen or where it comes from. So you really have an obligation yeah. as a manufacturer to dig down in the supply chain and know where everything comes from. I think the good news is consumers are learning that and they're, and they're starting to expect that. They are. And, uh, and I think that's appropriate. I mean, yes, absolutely. We don't want to, you know, use these wonderful toys on the backs of children making no money. I mean, right. that's, that's not good. I've always felt that, you know, manufacturers, U.S. companies tend to put such a focus on saving a few dollars mm. that most consumers in this country wouldn't mind paying a little bit more. I if believe they that. Said it went to the benefit of the employees yeah. building the product. And when you buy a, an iPhone for $1,000, you have some expectation that That's some right. of that money's trickling back down to the actual people who assembled the darn thing. You right? would certainly hope so. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> it's not lining Tim Cook's pocket. That's right. Uh, but boy, we have really come a long way. I mean, you, you've watched this whole process to this today, with the refinement we have. When you think about an iPhone, uh, this is a 6S Plus. Ooh, fancy. Yeah. You can't see it because I got it in a, in a silly case. But that's part of the ecosystem too, isn't it? In fact, the case makers the case. are probably making more than, the, uh, than Apple that's is right. on these phones. Well, I think Apple's doing pretty well. In aggregate. <laughs> Only in aggregate. In aggregate. No individual case maker. Let me, yeah, pl maybe pry, a let me pry this off. It's a shame because uh, as amazingly gorgeous as they are, they're so somewhat fragile. I wonder and what so, Johnny Ive would think about these, I know, cases, these cases. Right? I'm sure he would much prefer to see this. Well, but these break easily. <laughs> is that is that the This rose is the gold? pink. You want to, yeah, rose gold. Yeah. Pink. That looks it's pinkish. It has an interesting Well, see that's changes. I, you know, I I was giving Apple a hard time cuz in the pictures on the website I said, "That's pink." Right. And when you look at it straight on, it's pretty pinky. <laughs> but as you rotate it, I think there's more it's more interesting actually. It they is. do some sort of metallic thing here. It changes. Yeah. It, and it's yeah. and it's actually I think it's lovely. It's beautiful. Uh and it's but Look how, I mean, if we just step back and think about what's going on in here, the camera is like it better than an SX70. That's right. And that's just the camera. Now you have, I mean, this has got processors in here faster than the computers you and I were using just it's, 10 years ago. It's and amazing. It's incredible. And um, what, what's happened, it, it's become a lot easier and that helps everybody it's become a right. lot easier to build hardware products i think days. apple does get some of the credit for that don't they, they do you know um when the first iphone came out i was reviewing a um i've been writing a column for a san diego newspaper for a long time and i was looking at a nokia one of their phones and it looks so crude in comparison. <laughs> Instantly. To the, to the finish, Instantly. right yeah there were gaps there were it was but just, now I should go get, because I, like you, have a museum. I should go get the original iPhone, because when you compare that to this... It's incredible. It, there's a big the difference. The finish is yeah. just, it's perfect. Somebody was pointing out to me that even the little tiny screws on inside here are the, are the same kind of opalescent pink oh, wow. as the, I mean... Apple pays so much yeah. attention to detail. And I had a uh, Samsung uh, Note, and... The Apple fanboys are saying, oh, how can you use that thing? The alignment of the USB port and the speaker grill is, isn't, it's not a straight line across. Right. Wow. Well, okay. <laughs> Let's not they've get, really raised the bar. They have raised the bar. And they've the raised our taste as well. Yeah. So we look yeah. at other products and we say, gee, this is pretty crude. Yeah. Was that Steve? Steve and uh, his industrial design. Johnny, people. Steve. Johnny, yeah. and before Johnny, uh, Robert Bruner. He was there for the Newton, wasn't he? He was there for the Newton. And, yeah. and um, I had a small hardware team, and one of the members on the team was this new industrial designer that had just been hired, and that was Johnny Ive. Wow. And so this is mid 90s? Yeah. 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 Uh, they say now that the designer is king at Apple. When the designer, any designer, comes in the room, everybody goes, and listens because the designer is what it wasn't like that back it wasn't then. always that way because yeah. the designer wants to do things that the engineers say gee do we really need to do it it's going to delay right and um there's a little bit of that though even in the earliest days of apple that apple II case steve jobs said i don't want it to look like you know a, a, an altair or something right. i want it to look friendly and have smooth lines 
And the engineers who designed the boards and everything had to had to actually they did. make it something that was perhaps not engineering wise as as uh, as smart. Apple Here, always look has. At that. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! This is a 3G, I think, Jeez. or 3GS. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, for its time, we were all excited. Remember? We were. Yeah. We we all had it too. <laughs> yeah, and but you know, I mean, amazing. Yeah, it's not. Not quite Although the same I, I, league. I wish they'd make it a little thicker and put a little bigger bit, battery. Bigger battery, I right? Agree with I you, think Phil. that's where form doesn't follow function. You know, I, as I told you before we began, I've been using Android for a couple of years, and uh, I think this new one has wooed me back because there's enough power user features now, like the the 3D Touch, that I'm feeling like I, it's it's doing what I want it to do, and I I gotta say. There's no Android phone, no current Android phone that has anywhere near the battery life of the 6S Plus. Not the little one, but the Plus. This is this easily powers through well, all day. I think Google tomorrow is going to announce. We'll see. With a, with they a have a giant now. battery right, in the 6, exactly. uh, the 6P, I think it is. Yep. At least that's what the rumors say. We will be covering that event, by the way, 9 a.m. tomorrow. Right. I'll be here. Mike Elgin will be at the event. If you're curious about what I'll Google has. Home. It should be fun. Yeah. Marshmallow is coming. We're talking to Phil Baker, old friend, dear friend, who has for years brought me amazing products. What was the Seiko? It was a label printer. Thermal. A thermal label printer. It was the idea of you capturing an address on your computer. Oh, that's right. And printing out a single label. It would OCR and then print the label? Right. Wow. That's pretty good. It was cute at the time. Yeah. yeah. I, I kind of fell in love briefly with label makers. I had a right. bunch of them. And That's was right. putting a you know on and off label on the File switches. File folders. And all yeah. kind of <laughs> I grew out of that. Thank right. goodness. We'll have more in uh, in just a little bit with Phil Baker. Uh, and and I, I do want to talk about Quirky. I said I was going to talk about Quirky. I really want to ask you what went wrong at Quirky. Before we do that though, let's talk about 99 designs. You know, I had Natalie Morris on Twit yesterday, and she has a new project where she's doing. Uh, finance uh, and money for families and the chief, what does she call it, the chief home officer and it's really a it's a wonderful blog but it's just kind of plain, it's not immediately obvious what it's about and stuff. She said, yeah, I'm doing a contest on 99 designs for a new design. Brilliant! You th you're, the, and Phil knows this, the design says something about you, about your brand, about your product Design is really important, and a lot of us are tempted to do it ourselves. We think, oh, I could do that. I just get fire up Microsoft Word. I put that Word art thing, little curvy banner there. I'm done. It is a little bit more difficult than that. That's why I love 99designs. You should go to 99designs. Hundreds of thousands of designers are waiting for you. 900,000 designers, almost a million, are waiting for you to set up a design contest. You give them the details, the parameters, what you're looking for, everything from a logo, a menu, a car wrap, a website. They will submit their ideas. You pick the best, pay them, and work back and forth, and you're going to get a great design. Logo design started at $299. So it's fast, it's easy, it's affordable. They'll help you design stationery to go with your logo. This is a branding factory. We use it at Twit. We've done it uh, for our t-shirt designs, and they've been great. In fact, we liked them so much, we bought five of them from one contest. They were so great. They're, oh, this is my I love that one. Uh, and boy, you get a great price for it. And the, I'll tell you, the designers uh, are, sometimes people say, oh, come on, you, you know, $299. No, these guys are all over the world, and they're thrilled to be doing this. This is a great opportunity. They love it. We got great designs out of them. We give them credit for their designs. We also uh, had our uh, media kit redone at 99designs. Start your contest now. See the amazing designs you can get. There's That's the media kit. You'll have a design to start with, uh, to start using within seven days, your satisfaction, 100% guaranteed, 99designs.com slash twit. And by the way, because you're listening, a free $99 upgrade, 99designs will highlight your project listing, bump it to the top, they'll feature it on the blog. On average, you're gonna get about twice as many designs to choose from. That's nice, and that's free when you start your project at 99designs.com slash twit. 99designs.com slash twit. We thank them for their support of triangulation. We really appreciate it. This is part of that whole ecosystem that makes it a lot easier for an individual, instead of you know having to work for Apple, to, to do a new product, a new idea, right? That's right. It's all about leveraging 
And today you can leverage companies around the world as easily as yeah. the big companies can do it. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing. It's created so many opportunities for people to take an idea and then create a design out of it. What is this? Is this a Palm Visor? No, it says Visor. Oh, it's the stowaway. That's the stowaway. Yeah. For the visor. For God. The, right. Remember the visor? Yeah, I have one over here. <laughs> you, welcome to my museum. <laughs> you got a museum, I got a museum. Yeah, that's right. So you worked at Polaroid, and you went from Polaroid to where? I came out to California, worked for Atari. That's what got me to uh, California. My first computer, an Atari 400. Mine was the 800. Well, I quickly went to the 800 right. because the 400 the had keyboard. a chiclet right, keyboard. Exactly. So I decided, I think I says after entering in a 4,000 line uh, basic program from Compute Magazine wow. or one of those, <laughs> I said, you know, maybe I should be getting a better keyboard. I remember doing that as you, well. Yeah, sure. And yeah. one mistake, you, you load it on tape, it goes... <laughs> And, you, and one mistake, you got to go through the whole listing. Exactly. Oh, my fingers were, I had blisters on my fingers. <laughs> but uh, the Atari was great. It was kind of an Apple clone, wasn't it, really? It was sort of a, you know, we were sort of debating, do you buy the Apple II or do you buy the Atari? And right. I probably should have bought the Apple II. And I didn't. I, then I might have worked for Apple, but I worked for the, right. <laughs> bought the 800. And Me too. It was I, more of a game machine. That's why. The graphics. Star right? Raiders. Yeah. That's all I cared about. Right. I just want to pop a cartridge in there. But then you kind of get thinking and, 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 well, maybe I could do some more with this. I could write a basic program. Right. And it really eases you into the thing. It did. It was my introduction into yep. high tech. Me too. It was, it was pretty exciting, wasn't it? It was amazing. And, and, and this is the early days of Silicon Valley. We're talking the late 70s, right. yeah, no, um, early 80s. I came out in 83. 83. Yeah. And it was, even then, there was a buzz in the air. There was a buzz. It was exciting, and uh, Intel was the big company, yep. right? and yep. HP. Although the, you guys at Atari, you had very high self opinions. The Atari, the game programmers were. I, I knew a few of them. They'd walk around. Oh yeah. Yeah, I work at Atari because Atari was king of the world in yeah, games. It was, a, it was a very strange place. <laughs> <laughs> was Nolan still there when you were? No, there? he was gone. Yeah. And um, I went into the Atari Television. They were going to make telephones. <laughs> and uh, you know what happened to that? And well, <laughs> what happened to the rest of the company? Yeah. A year later, it was gone, pretty much. And it, I think that might have been the first bubble bursting in the tech That's industry right. was the game bubble. It was. Everybody thought these games would just you know, and they started cranking out terrible games, and there was a backlash. Customers bought ET and said, "What is this? This doesn't work. It's boring. That's right. It's not a good game." Nintendo learned that lesson, and of course, they beat Atari by making sure that every single game was That's right. high quality, but that was a few years and later. Atari ended up burying a bunch of games. Remember I have an ET cartridge. <laughs> I do. It's in from the, the other dump, room. From, <laughs> from the dump. No, mine never was buried, but you're right. They buried. We, they finally dug them up, thousands of cartridges That's for right. ET. That's right. Um, that was the beginning of the end. It was. And, and then from there... I worked for Seiko. That's when you started working at Seiko. Right. Seiko you were there a long time little, then. I worked on little dictionaries and uh, remember the little... Yeah, you'd have a... $15 dictionary. Yeah, it was a computer. Right. But it, all it did was look up words. That's right. And I worked for a company called um, Polycom. Oh, yeah. they make We still have Polycom That's phones right. in our conference That's room, right. I bet. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and but it's interesting because for a while there was a whole era of standalone, do one thing computers. They'd play right. one game. Right. They were really cheap. They were handheld devices and they were, they were dictionaries, they were games, they were, you know, just a variety of little what? things. Well, how, did that, how did that happen? Well, I think it was driven to a large degree by the Japanese. You know, uh, the handheld games from Nintendo and then uh, um, Casio and Seiko and, you know, I don't know if you ever went to Japan during that time. I have, I've, I've never been to Tokyo and I've, always, I've been to like Nagasaki. Oh, you have to, well, you walk into any of the I want to go to, what yeah. is it, Akihabara? Akihabara. Uh, I want to go there. Yodabashi Camera, which is now a... But is it still like it was? It, I haven't been there in a couple of years, but it's still there. It's, it's everything. It's everything. And you see gadgets you will never see in the U.S. Yeah, it's, it's a little less isolated now because you can go online now. Right. And, but you see things that just don't come to the U.S. It's amazing. It's a kid in a candy store. I remember the little tiny full power computers 
the, like the libretto. The Japanese were really That's into right. these little, like really little. In fact, Steve Gibson had one. He would type like this. The Toshiba, <laughs> yeah. it was Toshiba libretto, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> it, it was a full computer. It was like they took a laptop and put it in a drawer and he That's shrunk right. it. It was. It had a full keyboard and everything. And Casio did a lot of these yeah. things. It was, it was amazing. The Japanese liked miniaturization. Small That's was right. good. And they knew that these aren't, they never sold them in the U.S. because they knew. That's right. And their fingers were smaller, maybe, right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why. It just, it's cultural. I, they like small things and we they just, do. we like big things, right? They're very into miniaturization. And yeah. they do a wonderful job at, at doing well, stuff very small. Did you ever look at a product and think, this is going to be the next big thing and it just never went anywhere? I have, and I've seen, done the opposite. You know, right. just like you, I see a lot of products. People send a lot of products, and I'll look at something and I'll say, "This will never make it." What are they thinking? You know, <laughs> and uh, um, some of them were mine. No. <laughs> do, you, do you remember any in particular, or do you um, want to not name names? I wouldn't blame no, you. No, I'm trying to. Trying to <laughs> well, I remember um, Sony would come out with a very small folding. Um, computer and they right. have a keyboard that would just be too small right and I said you have to what are they thinking you know yeah. they just who's gonna use that? exactly yeah. so I think that was an example yeah um, but I remember but then they made the Clio remember that was based on the pilot operating right, system Clio and we ended Clio. Up, we yeah. ended up selling keyboards to Sony for the Clio yeah and um, that was a that was an interesting what happened time. to Sony Sony is now a shell of its former self. You know, I remember going to Japan when I was at Polaroid. I'd go to Japan, and every time I'd go there, the first thing I would do was go down to Aka Harbor and get the Sony catalog. Right. To see what was new. Right. And and what can I buy on this trip, right? Yes. <laughs> the Walkman I bought over there, mm -hmm. it, was, it was amazing. And they just lost their way. When I was at Polaroid, uh, Edwin Land was very close to uh, uh, Marito. The Aki, Aki, Aki Marito. Aki yeah, Aki yeah, Marito, yeah. the the and, um, CEO, the founder. CEO, right. Yeah. And Sony was just an amazing company, and yet they lost their way. I think they became when when he died, they became very siloed, a lot of infighting. I mean, it was really terrible. It was Akio Morita as a co-founder who had the vision. Right. And when he's gone, and it, he was there a long time. He was there a long time. Then they just lose their way. They lose their way. No one is directing them. They were too. It was and just, it's a object lesson for every big company. He didn't leave anybody in his wake. Yeah. And, um, and that was a problem with Land as well. When he left, right. there was nobody there to take over the reins. I'm looking, just in case anybody wants to know. I'm looking for somebody to take the reins. <laughs> I'm sure you'll have a lot of volunteers. <laughs> anybody want to take the reins? <laughs> you can have them. <laughs> you can have them. Yeah. Well, that was a concern about Apple when... Steve Absolutely. Did. And yet, you know, Tim Cook seems to be holding his own. Well, we didn't know. Uh, it looked like Steve was very resistant to the idea of having a successor. Yes. That he did not want... When he got sick, they didn't do a CEO search. He, he was very resistant to that. But what we didn't know, and I think we've learned now, is that all along, he had in mind who was going to take over. And he knew it was going to be Tim Cook. He knew that Phil Schiller would be doing... He, I think he really knew who would be running Apple in his wake. He had a very tight team. And I think that he was all along kind of readying them for the inevitable. I think so. I don't think he's the kind that would have wanted to go outside and rely on somebody else. No, that was the point. Right. right. Didn't, and, didn't want somebody who did not have that Apple right. and, bleed and the what rainbow. What seems to be happening is Apple is doing better than ever. Yeah, it's a very different company, though, than the company I'm you sure. and I knew in the, <laughs> in the 80s and the 90s. When um, I was there, I was between jobs. Right, and, and, right. You know, he had not he had left and hadn't come right, back. Right, you yet. were in the Scully era. And that was a tough time. Yeah. Well, you look at the three CEOs. Uh, in fact, that's this is when we met, is right, right around that right. time. And I w people hated me because I'd say Apple is just, they're going down. I mean, you've got, uh, Scully wasn't so bad, but then you had Schindler, who was terrible. Right. And Emilio Spindler. 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 Yes. Schindler was the list. <laughs> Spindler was Apple. Right. And, yeah. Herr Spindler was terrible. He was. And, and it was exactly what Steve would have said, which is these guys don't have that Apple in their blood. They That's don't. Right. 
They don't get what we're they don't get what we're doing, which is not like any other company in the world in the history of the world. And and today they're unlike any other company. They still no, are. Nobody could do what they're doing. They still are. From yeah. the software and hardware yeah. integration. Yeah. I mean they're just amazing. What's interesting to me is they're not doing exactly what Steve would have done. I think Steve said, look, don't in fact he said in the in the biography, he said to his biographer Walter Isaacson, I don't want them to say what would Steve do. I don't want them to do that. I want them to say what would we do. Exactly. Brilliant, hard to do, and I think they have done that. I think we often, as journalists, say, "I don't know if Steve would have released an Apple Watch." And, but, right, I know. Yeah, <laughs> but it doesn't matter because this is a new company in, in new people running a company that is in a very different environment, and boy, you can't knock success. That's right, or an Apple pencil. I like the pencil. Steve would have never. No, but I'm looking at it, and I've talked yeah. to people who have, and I'm thinking that is. But see, you're right, Steve. He famously said, I don't ever what stylus. If you've yeah, done a finger. stylus, you've failed. Right. You've got a finger. <laughs> that wasn't quite enough. No, I think they're doing great. So what happened at Quirky? Quirky was a very, I think, a very good idea. They, they created a company that they would, inventors would come to them. They would help the inventor, using the wisdom of the crowds, refine their product, help them bring it to market, right? That's right. But it wasn't like in you know some inventors submission bureau. It was a company that really it did was real. Work. It was real. It was real. And and I, I remember when they first uh, came out, and my reaction was, this is really this is like crowdsourcing. This yeah. is sort of like pre Kickstarter, where you let ideas rise up and the better ideas would stay and then exactly. they would develop it. The um, but all the focus was around ideas and, and, and creating the ideas. The issue that, the thing that worried me when I read about it and wondered how well they could do was they had so many ideas that were in so many different areas that to go market them and sell them, they had to go to different kind of retailers. Well, well I think first they tried selling them online. Direct, direct. Yeah. And, and from all my experience, you can do so much directly, but you uh, you've got to get in stores. Have to get into stores. Yeah. And so, they had different kinds of products that would go in different kinds of stores that would have different buyers. So when you go into a a Best Buy and you have a particular category of product, you deal with one buyer. A different category, you deal with a different one. So the overhead to try to market the product was pretty. Pretty extensive. They were maybe ahead of their time. Uh, they were. Because we're in a transitional period where the retailers still, the brick and mortar still have a lot of influence. You do. And, and, and there's uh, just no way to go to these. You know, it's the same thing with cable television in a way. In order to become a successful cable channel, we learned this at Tech TV, you got to go to every town right. and every market with a little black bag full of cash. <laughs> and it it's, doesn't scale well at all. Exactly. The internet's changed everything. It has, but you still, there are very few companies that sell 100% of right. their product online. We're not there yet. Right. I the, think we will be at some point. We will. They had some great products. They had the Pivot, which I, you know, quick buy a Pivot because right. I don't know how much well, I bought some of their products. They were very well Great done. stuff. They yeah. were well made, but they, as you point out, they had way too many. They did. And, and uh, they uh, went on September 22nd, they filed Chapter 11. Uh, uh, they say they're trying to find a home for the community because it's really the community is what made Quirky work. Um, but there will not be a Quirky um, after the uh, the courts get to it. Shame, yeah. I've yeah. I've seen some of their products at the container store and elsewhere, and they're well generally they're well done. But they also had a big infrastructure to try to go. Every product had to be tooled. And had a manufacturer, yeah. and they had it. And anytime you do a product, you really need a sizable volume to pay back all the investment that you put into that product. Does it mean that you can't, I mean, just come from nowhere and have a great hit and a great success? Do you no, have I, to be an Apple to do this? No, you don't have to be an Apple or, or Sony or anybody these days. Yeah. The beauty of, of today is that you can find companies that will build your product that have experience. You can leverage. Right. And it's all about leveraging. And it's about doing what you do best and finding other companies that do what they do best. And finding a manufacturer, for example, that knows how to build a product in your category. So I had a um, client at one point, a number of years ago, that wanted to build a GPS for the golf game. And you know, you go online and you can find 
30 GPS companies, yeah, right? Yeah. And many of them are shells, but some of them are real, and you basically can have them build a product for you. And, Interesting. Uh, yeah. And then you just put your own little wrapper around yeah. it that makes it unique. And when we did we did the Pono, we we were able to find a. I want to. We're going to talk about yeah. that. I found really... a good company over in Asia that yeah. could build the product. So, yeah. Um, these days, there's lots of great manufacturers. Um, you have to spend a lot of time over there, and you have to. You can't just send over drawings and six months later go over and pick up your product. It Do you have to? To get in there, make the product, and sell it fast. I'm thinking about. You know this new these new um, they sometimes call them hoverboards. My my son calls them a cyberboard. It's a Segway without a handle. Right. And a Chinese company just kind of invented this. And within months, there were 20 Chinese companies making them. And if you go online, you can spend anything from $200 to $2,000. It's not clear what the difference is. They all look like the same thing. Do you have to? How do you protect this invention? Bring it to market and make the money you deserve. Patents don't do it, obviously, right. especially in China. Right, right. Well, patents help you. If you have a patent, it prevents a company, even in China, from bringing the product into the U.S. So that's where the value is. Right. It doesn't stop them from selling it in China. <laughs> Which is the biggest market it, for a lot of exactly. these. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's time to market. So you've got to get out yeah. quickly, yeah. get wide distribution. Yeah. And then while somebody's looking at copying your product, you're working on the next generation. You can't really stop them from re reverse engineering it, can you? You know, it takes, um, no. I mean, it takes a year and a half, two years for your patent to come out. Right. So during that time, your product may already be obsolete. Would it be better not to patent it? Because the, the whole patent system is set up and really by the founding fathers to foster an open transfer of knowledge. So you, it's, there's a little quid pro quo, as the patent holder, you publish how you do it, right. but you get protection for 17 years or whatever right. the time frame is. Right. So you're really telling, when you patent it, you're saying, this is it. One of my favorite chapters in the book is legal advice and when to ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Sometimes the patent it, is it not It depends the, on the product. I mean, yeah. if you're doing something, that, a medical product that has a lot of intellectual property, you do want to patent it. But if you're doing something that's going to have a life of two years or a year yeah. and a half, you know, don't, don't waste your money necessarily. Just get it out there. Try to get the sales up, get distribution. We did that with the keyboard. We we had Palm and Targus distribute the product. So three months after we finished the production, we were in stores all around the world, and and getting sales before you before other companies had a chance. You have thirty patents, though. I do, but a lot of them are kind of useless. <laughs> <laughs> I was at Polaroid, and they would patent if you know. If well, that's you, what Apple does. They have a whole building that just. And that's right. I mean, yeah. if you would uh, make a square wastebasket, right. they would patent, patent it. it. Why not? That's right. You got lawyers on retainer. They ain't doing nothing. Exactly. <laughs> and 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 Polaroid grew up with that, uh, you know, with that philosophy of patenting everything, and it kept yeah. them. You know, kept the, protected them against I, Kodak. I've heard that's what Apple does. That when you have a, a, a product design meeting, immediately afterwards you'll be debriefed by lawyers who will say, "Okay, tell me all this stuff. I can, I can patent that. Okay, I can patent that. I can patent that." Exactly. And it's why you know sometimes you'll see news outlets. We don't do this, but some news outlets trumpet the new Apple patent. Oh my God, Apple just patented mayonnaise-free screens, right. and <laughs> it's just it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't. That's right. Exactly. And yet, you know, Apple Insider is always publishing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't get excited, kids. Right. <laughs> exactly. Do you think they're doing a car? Yes. I think they're looking at it. I don't know whether they're, they're doing it. They're definitely looking at it. They're definitely looking at it. But that's even, I'm sure, in, in your day, that's what Apple does. That's what any good company does, Is especially if you have a lot of cash and an R&D. Exactly. Look at their budget. I mean, look yeah. at their... Yeah, they have billions. They should be. Right? They should be looking at everything, but that doesn't mean you're going to do it. You know, Apple would like to do the, your interface for your next car. Yeah. But it's probably very difficult for the automotive companies to give that up. Right. So if Apple wants to do it, they, might they have, have to do, to do the car. Right. Uh, would you buy an Apple car? Uh, would consider it. Uh, yeah, I, I think about sure. it. Why not? Yeah. All right, we're going to talk Pono. I really want to talk Pono. Sure. I, uh, when I heard that, because Neil Young had been going around for years, literally talking up this idea of higher quality music. 
and I was actually on a show, I think it was Mac Break Weekly, and somebody said, "There's a Neil's Kickstarter just went up. And I got in there like that, and I have the uh, po signed Pono player and everything. I want to talk to you about Pono okay. and how that happened. Were you there at the beginning, or when did I, you get brought I was brought there. I've been there for Neat. three and a half years. Nice. A year before Kickstarter. Nice. I think you sent me an email. I did. And I probably ignored it. <laughs> I apologize. It's not personal. I know. I, I, get, I ignore emails. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I get way too much email. Uh, let me talk about food. This is an invention uh, that some say, Michael Pollan says, cooking was what made us human. The eye, and, and there are a lot of uh, evolutionary bio biologists who say until we were able to cook food and get the maximum nutrition out of it, our brain couldn't br grow. It's what made us human. And Pollan says it's the social part of it, the act of cooking, the act of sitting down, eating a meal together. This is something we don't want to lose. We're starting to lose it in the modern age of, of technology and TV and uh, screen in every pocket. I got a great solution for you. Blue Apron. Bring the family together around a meal you made they're going to, it'll blow their mind. They say, they'll say, Dad, you cook this? You're good. Blue Apron, and I love how they do this. This is not, They don't cook it for you. They deliver you all the ingredients to cook an amazing, delicious meal in a refrigerated box. Everything's fresh, even the meats, the fish. It's all fresh. The produce is from local farms. It's at the peak of perfection. You never get more than you need. See those little bottles? You don't get a big bottle of soy sauce that you got to store in the fridge for the next 10 years, you get just the right amount to make that one recipe. you got to go to blueapron.com slash twit. Look at the menus. Incredible stuff. Spikes and stuff you would probably never make. Stuff you would say, well, I, I can't do this. Spiced turkey with chick and chickpea chili with chamula, labna. I don't even know what this is. And pita croutons. It sounds good. Seared chicken and caramelized fennel. <gasps> Seared Sam, oh yeah, let's make this. Let's make this tonight. So here's the deal. You, you, by the way, you can say no to anything. You can work with them. Uh, we sent it to Mary Jo Foley, she's a vegetarian. They have great vegetarian choices. They have family, there's two plans. There's the, the dinner for two, which is great for date night, guys. You are gonna impress the lady in your life. And if you want a lady in your life, this is something you ought to be doing. I tell my son this all the time. Learn to make merguez lamb sausages with fresh lentils and mint yogurt sauce. She'll love you. They say the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. I think it goes both ways, definitely. And if you cook it, they think you can cook. And in fact, you can, because you know what? It's really easy. They give you a menu, like a recipe card with pictures. They even have videos. If you're not sure how to slice or dice or whatever, you can go to the website, watch the videos. That's all up there, by the way. If anybody wants to uh, do this, even without subscribing, blueapron.com slash twit, you're going to learn all about it. And that's really fantastic. Once you've made this recipe, by the way, you'll have the, con look at that. What? What is, oh my, Ugh. all this time I've been using a knife to do that. <laughs> oh my gosh. BlueApron.com slash twit. Best ingredients, ten, less than $10 a meal. You'll cook it. You'll never get the same meal twice, which is nice. Now you know how to make it. You can do it yourself. They have family plans with kid-friendly ingredients. It's just luscious. It's wonderful. Shipping is free. The menus are always new. Cooking takes, they say, a half hour. I'm a little slow. Sometimes it'll take me 45 minutes. But the best part is I don't have to go shop. I get home from work, and I've got a Blue Apron box. In fact, we've got a Blue Apron box right now waiting for me. I might make chicken tetrazzini tonight. <laughs> Blueapron.com slash twig. Go there right now. Get your first two meals free. Blueapron.com slash twig. Your first two meals free. We're talking to Phil Baker. A couple of years ago, he wrote this book, From Concept to Consumer. He is a product guy. I think that's the best title in the world. You take products from conception to market. And you've done it again and again. And the latest is the Pono Player. You're working there. Did, did Neil come to you? How did Neil find you? Uh, Neil and I had a mutual friend, and um, he got a copy of my book and called me one day and said, um, I've been trying to develop a product for six months. I've worked with this big company in Silicon Valley, and we put in about half a million dollars, and all we have are three PowerPoint presentations. Ay, ay, ay. Can you help me? And I said, well, let me spend some time with you and understand what you're looking for and and after I did I said I think I can I the way I would work is find two or three really strong 
individuals in the skills that are needed and put a little team together and that's what I did. Do you hire them? Are they freelancers? These are free people that are generally consultants, but mm -hmm. they're really good at what they do. Mm -hmm. yeah, so what were, the, what were the team members? What, what, what did you need? So there were, I needed a um, uh, hardware architect okay. that could figure out... Processor. Uh, exact processor and the, and the various components, mm -hmm. and that was um, somebody that had worked for me at, at Apple. See, but, having the connections helps, too. You know who's good. You know, it was good. And yeah. It was an individual by the name of Dave Gallatin who worked for me on the Newton. He, he was the nice. hardware architect at the Newton. Nice. And um, an industrial designer. Yeah. Who I love, you know, people have mocked the industrial design. It's not exactly pocketable, but it's right. brilliant because you can sit it here, you can sit it here, the screen rotates. It really works well, and, you know, it's... Um, oh, let's show you. This is the yellow one. I have the right. silver one with Neil's signature you on do? it. You do? That's yeah. a rare... I know. Indeed. Right. I know. I use it all the time. Yeah. So you... So... Now, and par I, I figured part of the design is you also have to have room for components. You do, because this is a uh, product that we made no compromises in terms of audio right. quality. Right. So it's got some big capacitors right. um, because of the... Why, like, why is that? Uh, for the output stage to oh, be Oh, okay, yeah. the amplifier. Yeah, yeah, the amplifier. And then the amplifier itself was done by um, this this real genius uh, audio engineer by the name of Charles Hansen. Who so you didn't buy that off the shelf? You made no, no, that. no. We, we looked around because yeah. we could, you can do an off-the-shelf design, but it was nothing special. Charles Hansen has a company called Air Electronics developed this, and so no off-the-shelf chips, all individual components, hand-selected, hand-tuned, and, um, and that's, that was his expertise. He was building yeah. $20,000 amplifiers, wow. and still is, and so he put that technology in this. And People um, talk a lot about the DAC, the digital to analog converter. You have to have right. a DAC that can handle these high bit right. rate files. It, it was the best DAC that we could find. That is an off-the-shelf. That's an ESS component. Yeah. It's terrific. Yeah. And did you have? Did Neil say it can cost? Can only cost this much? Did you have a constraint? We there? had no constraint on cost, but um, and and one of the you know one of the implications is it it does cost a little bit more, but it's it's Not also a little bit less. But it's three ninety nine retail is very very competitive. Yeah. Because it compares to products that sell for twenty four hundred dollars. Right. Mean, so it's well even the early iPods cost more oh, than yeah, four hundred dollars. Yeah. I mean this is. It's in the ballpark. Oh, it's very competitive, yeah. and and uh, you know with volume, the the price can can get even down lower. You chose Android for the operating system. We chose Android because That's, it was oh. a uh, off the shelf, no cost, right? And right. Uh, you know it has a lot of the elements that you need, right? You know, screen drivers, and devices right. like that, right? Touch screen. Uh, how many prototypes did you end up doing? We went. By the through, way, you need to charge this one. I've been trying to turn it on. Oh, I know. It was just <laughs> pulled up. I should have brought mine. It's charged. I keep it always charged. Well, I've got I one. love my Pono player. The music is awesome. It really sounds You do amazing. one thing that I really like, and I actually went out and I got a special adapter for it because I have a, a magnetic planar uh, headphones, which take a lot of power. So what you there's a switch in here, and I've never seen this in a player before. There's two phono jacks, ostensibly one's for headphones and one's for line out. But you can, in software, say, I want to use them both to power the headphones. And That's I right. do that, and it's, it's incredible. It's, it's called balance mode. It's incredible. Here, we can turn one on so we can show people. The, oh, this is the rare silver one. That was a prototype, actually. Is it really? Yeah. Looks just like mine. It does. <laughs> we, we, we had to get it right before. Why we... Kickstarter? Uh, was that the plan all along, or? No, I think the problem was it was always difficult to raise money. Right. For this, um, a lot of. Oh, you have the same music I do. This could be mine, the Beatles, Carajan. We have the same taste. Same yeah, we do. I don't have Billy Elliot. I do have Brothers in Arms. Same century. Some, yeah, same century. <laughs> Nora Jones, Come Away With Me, sounds oh, so good. Oh, yeah. Sounds so good. It's one of the best. You, you, you know, if you really want to appreciate... Oh, Simon and Garfunkel. Listen to a modern, all-digital uh, recording. I think they've done some really great stuff. There's, of course, Neil Young. Yeah. Um, Forrest Gump soundtrack. I don't, I've not heard That's that. That's not very high resolution, but it was yeah. part of my old collection. It's one of the issues, of course, and uh, is, is, I'm not going to put you on the spot with this, but a lot of uh, the Pono music is just upsampled CDs. It's not. No, we don't do it. No, we. You don't do that. We don't do upsample. 
No, no pun on the Some have in fact, some have claimed, uh, yeah. but you say, you'll say right now this is we not. Said, that's right. If we find something that was upsampled, it goes off. So you get them from the labels, right? We get them from the labels. We also go out and create products, create new recordings, you know, that may be quality. locked away, that may be yeah. locked away in right. and, and, and high, absolutely high quality. Yeah. And we have a we have a commitment now that if somebody buys a recording and it eventually comes out in a higher res, I we saw that them free. It's called the Pono Promise. Yes, I saw that. And and that so far I don't have any. I bought, uh, nothing I have yeah. this needs to be upgraded. But and that's because uh, we don't want people to go out right. and buy multiple times. They bought the product. They bought music enough times, right? You know. You have the 24-bit Beatles. Did you buy the little green apple? Yes. <laughs> so yes. did I. Yes. I For did. my Pono player. I, good hard money. I, I know. <laughs> well spent. It was. It's, it's, it's a amazing. beautiful thing. It, it it's is. a work of art. It really is. So, um, what other what problems did you run up against? How many prototypes did you have to make? Because this looks just like the one you saw. Yeah, we built several hundred, pro, um, and we tested them, and right. we, uh, um, because the audio, the audio, we thought. We didn't know how it would come together. You know, it's right. got a couple of hundred components, what are the tolerances and so forth. But it turned out that that was the least of the issue. The, you know, the real problem was, you know, getting the screen to work well. And uh, it's a getting, touch getting, screen, getting, which is nice. It's a touch screen, yeah. getting enough battery power. The, you know, the electronics. Good battery life. The electronics tends to generate, <clears throat> um, you know, require more battery power because yes. of its of its design. Right. It's not using chips. Right. So we had to put a bigger battery in. Oh, that's interesting. You're yeah. right. It's not all. It's not all integrated circuits. Exactly. You've got you've got an amplifier yeah. that's componentized. Exactly. So people yeah. say, well, the battery they like to see it longer, but that's one of oh, the it's compromises. Plenty. It's ten so hours, I think. It, yeah, yeah, I yeah, get it's eight to ten hours. Eight to, I get plenty of time yeah. on this. And I just keep it plugged in every night because I'm going to be listening. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, you so, can play it through your stereo too. I mean, it has line out. You do, and yeah. in fact, I don't think there's anything better that you can play through your stereo right now. I think you're than, right, than unless you have a good DAC. Like if you went out and bought a very fancy DAC for your stereo, right, like the Oppo or something, exactly. But uh, but that's a twelve hundred dollar. Exactly. Product. I mean, this this delivers sound. That's, I love it. That's amazing. Yeah. Right. Um, so we did the kicks. The Kickstarter was not planned. Um, but we needed to raise some money. It's a good way to market too, isn't it? It is, and we also wanted to see if there's any market out there for this concept. And this is so. At the very beginning, I said one of the challenges is you don't can't tell. You may think you have a brilliant idea, but it's only at the end of the road of hundreds of thousands of dollars or more invested that you'll know. That's except right. the Kickstarter and things like it give you it. Not only do they help you with the money. They get more, maybe even more importantly, they help you gauge the market. They do. They give you a sense of whether there's interest. Look at that. $6.2 million. And that, that number is very misleading. You don't get all that money? You know, <laughs> more than two-thirds of that money went to pay for the product we committed to deliver. Oh, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. But at least you got a product. I oh, mean, you made a product. but that enabled us to get a product. Right. That's not right. profit. We're not saying that's no, profit. No, no. Yeah, it's yeah. not like... Wow, you're millionaires! No, no. I mean, you, and we had to do the development of the store and the. Right. And did the, Neil put it? Didn't Neil put some of his own money into it? He did, it? And, yeah. and several of his friends put some money yeah. in. But you know, it takes hardware. One of the things about hardware is it costs a lot of money to get right. a hardware product out. So when Neil was on here, and boy, I, I was like just kind of shaky that, yeah. at the knees yeah. to talk to Neil Young, who is one of my absolute all-time favorites. He said that was the favorite interview he's ever No, had. don't yes. say that no, to me if did. it's not true. No, he loved it because it was, you know, it was long and it was... It was, it and was, he, we had fun. He took his picture. He said, my agent has my picture, my manager has my picture on the wall. That's not me. I wouldn't do that. So he took it down. That was hysterical. And he was pointing to the bricks as pixels. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good analogy. It was. He, I was impressed. He's very, very smart. Brilliant. Oh, I'm not surprised. And and he said to me that this is the most important thing he's ever done oh, in his career. Him. Not the Cadillac. I guess not. <laughs> no. I want him to make that. He's he's what he. Wait, tell me what's that? What, he took a Cadillac. It was the suicide door is a Lincoln, suicide door Lincoln, and he's put some the Link Fold. It's called the what? Link Fold. Link Fold. Link Vault. Volt. It's an electric 
Lincoln. Right. Yeah, exactly. I want to buy it. Yeah. Uh, Is he going to ever make that? Well, he drives it around. I know, but he's got one. <laughs> he's got one, right. I know. You need, would you do me, it's just like a, just as a favor, would you help him make that a product? Sure. An electric plug-in Lincoln with suicide doors, the Link Volt. Oh, I want that so bad. Maybe that's what happens to it. You know, that'd be smart. <laughs> um, he showed us, though, when he was here, and I, it's, I don't think it's come out yet, that you could listen in different sound qualities to what's on your Pono. Is that out yet? It's on now, yeah. If you upgrade your... I should software, upgrade the firmware. You upgrade the okay. firmware, yeah. Because that's going to be telling. If somebody, you plug in, you got to have good headphones or put a good stereo, and then you say, okay, I'm going to play different versions. You tell me which one you like best. You could play a down-sampled MP3 version. Okay. You could play the high-res version. You could play a CD quality. And you can do an AB right there. You can. What, one of the things we notice is that when you do that, even your old MP3 or your or the CD quality sounds better on this With a device. good amp, yeah. it makes a big difference. It does. Yeah. It does. So Most people, let's face it, are listening uh, to an iPod right. with not the best circuitry on right. very cheap headphones. And it's background music, and then I. Yeah, that's fine. Attention. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. As Neil says, if that's if that's what you like and that's all you can tell the difference, great. More yeah. power to you. He, he, I mean, I, as I, I don't, did I point this out to him or not? His last album, he recorded in one of those little booths that they record on uh, a little wax disc. Right, right. He I know. <laughs> Mr. High Fidelity. <laughs> the Storytone yeah. album. I know that. Hi-fi, though. 24-bit. <laughs> yes, yes. There was something ironic there. <laughs> Uh, no, Neil is a is a god. He's just amazing. but it's um it, it's a great device and it's I love um, it. I've been very happy to buy it. My wife, who has seen me develop all kinds of products and from Polar Vision to she all she's a long suffering spouse. She said this is the best product nice ever ever done, and she's a musician. She's, oh. she sings in a oh. choral group. And oh, she listened for the first time and she yeah. said she almost cried. She said I Whoops. can. I, it's the I, batteries for <laughs> I can I can hear what I can hear when yeah. I sing with the San Diego Symphony. I know where all the musicians, musicians know. are. I know the depth. Yeah. And the, and the, nice. I'm sure those batteries are no longer. Uh, <laughs> no, their energizers are probably still going. When are we going to get better batteries? Do you know anything about that? Question. I, you know, I'm a consumer of products, and we all need better batteries. We it's have all these slow. fabulous portable devices I know. and technology, battery technology from 20 years ago. Well, lithium-ion batteries are pretty modern, I guess. Slowly, slowly better and better. Yeah. Um, they don't have the history. Remember, you used to have to recharge. Oh yeah, and I yeah guess, the memory effect. Right. Yeah, horrible. Right. But even, you know, even with um, your iPhone, you know, three or four hundred charges and. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It's, uh... Phil's so fun to see you again. Well, Thank you for coming by, bringing some really great memories. Well, it's my pleasure. Did we and... see all the toys you brought? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can still get the book, which I've also dropped along with the batteries, Anna, <laughs> of your keyboard. It's uh, called From Concept to Consumer, published by Pearson Education. Phil Baker. Get it on Amazon. You can get the Kindle edition. If you've got an idea, it would be a good idea to read this, that's your homework. Yeah. Read it, call me, email me. Are you looking for the next big thing? Oh, I'm always, I'd like to help help that's people nice. out. You know, it's fun. I don't want people to make the same mistakes I've made over the years. What's the worst mistake you made? Believing your own hype. <laughs> <laughs> I've fallen for that once or twice. Not you. <laughs> Phil Baker, great Thank to you. see you. Thank great, you for great coming. Great to see you, Leo. Oh, Thank really you. fun. It's been a pleasure. We do triangulation every Monday morning, 11 a.m. Pacific. That would be about 2 p.m. Eastern time, 1800 UTC. If you want to stop by and watch, the chat room is a great big part of it. Wait a minute. In fact, Dallas is saying, the best of Phil Baker 2011, personal technology at home, on the road, and on the go. You have another book. I'm not aware of that. Maybe the, uh, maybe the, the <laughs> newspaper put it together. Oh, it's from the newspaper, probably. It's from the, yeah. uh, it's the San Diego? San Diego, tran sctranscript.com. And now I have a blog called BakerOnTech.com. BakerOnTech.com. Right. First place you should go if you want to learn more. Right. Thank you Thank all. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all. all. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next time on Triangulation. Bye-bye. Oh, what fun. Well, I can't put this together, though. Yeah. <laughs>